Well, good afternoon, everyone. Stuart Holliday here, President of Meridian International Center. We're delighted to have you uh, joining my good friend, Ben Chang, uh, in this program on diplomacy in the Zoom era. It's gonna be a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, Meridian, as most of you know, is a center for diplomacy, leadership, and culture. We streak, seek to strengthen U.S. engagement with the world. We've been around around 60 years. And one of uh, my favorite programs, which really was initiated by incredible leaders like Ben, is the Rising Leaders Council. And the Rising Leaders Council brings together uh, mid-career professionals, and actually they're very senior professionals, um, to uh, exchange ideas and discuss some of the most important issues of the day. And these uh, members are from various different sectors and it creates a very interesting dynamic. And many of them are in key decision-making roles in our uh, international affairs landscape, business landscape, diplomatic landscape. And today's program is particularly special for me. It's a little bit of a Georgetown reunion. Uh, not only is Ben who is also a former colleague when I had the opportunity to serve the United States as our ambassador at the UN Security Council, uh, with Ben up there helping uh, me not say things that were inappropriate and to advance our, uh, our policies. But also across the street uh, was Stefan Dujaric, who at the time, uh, he's now reprising his role, was the lead uh, public affairs official at the United Nations. And it was fun to work with Stefan um, because we also were classmates and hallmates freshman year at Georgetown. And it is interesting to see how you know, careers and lives have evolved, but we're delighted to have you today. And Ben, I'd like to thank you and the Rising Leaders Council for everything you do and, and turn, turn, it, turn it over to you to introduce the panel and take it from here. Thanks very much, Ambassador Holliday. And it is indeed good to see you and to bring a little bit of the band back together here during these uh, very disrupted times. Uh, a big thanks, as you said, to uh, the broader team at Meridian, Meridian International, uh, in particular, Megan Devlin, who's the head of communications and marketing for the center, uh, who serves as our invaluable Rising Leaders Council liaison. Uh, thanks to the speakers today, whom you'll meet in just a moment, and fellow RLC members who are uh, tuning in right now and who've contributed to the ideas behind this event. Uh, indeed, uh, speaking of disruption, often the RLC events, uh, as Ambassador Holliday noted, um, uh, bring together these different uh, stakeholders and uh, different uh, sectors uh, in person for uh, dinners or other convenings at Meridian, uh, a, a spot that is uh, uh, close to many of our hearts uh, in DC. Uh, and in, during these times, we're having to find other ways to uh, convene not only our membership, but expand and open our doors up. Uh, and, and this is an example of today's event of how uh, ideally we can find ways to broaden our conversations. Um, we're going to pack a lot in uh, over the next hour, uh, so I will be brief, uh, which I recall from my days uh, around the Security Council table with Ambassador Holiday, when someone would say in diplomatic parlance, I'm going to be brief, that often meant the opposite, but I will try to hold true to that. Uh, the topic of the day, of course, uh, uh, which permeates our lives uh, is disruption, and in particular disruption of diplomacy and the traditional practice of diplomacy uh, and how uh, uh, diplomats and those um, international civil servants who staff diplomacy are adjusting uh, to this new era. Uh, given Meridian's focus, as Ambassador Holiday detailed, we thought this was particularly uh, trenchant for today. Uh, my role uh, as moderator um, is uh, to help facilitate uh, the questions for the panelists and our speaker and also field your questions. So there should be a Q&A function set up on your Zoom screen and I will be keeping an eye on those uh, questions as they come in. So please do share your thoughts. Uh, given that I hung up my uh, diplomat hat a few years ago, uh, though not the bow tie, some of you who know my work attire will recall, uh, I am in higher ed now, uh, but diplomacy is always close to my heart uh, I served as a Foreign Service Officer for the U.S. State Department for over 18 years, uh, and while currently serving as uh, Deputy Vice President uh, for Communications uh, and University Spokesperson at Princeton, uh, hence my backdrop, uh, public service over this shoulder uh, will always be close to my heart. And so having an opportunity to bring a conversation like this together is uh, uh, quite warming. 
we will first hear from Stefan, as Ambassador Holiday noted, uh, and then uh, after a question or two, bring in our panel, as well as a special guest. So let's start by introducing uh, Stefan. Uh, uh, Stefan and I have uh, known each other since our early younger diplomatic days uh, in the 90s uh, when he was then spokesperson for UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. Uh, he has served a total of three Secretary General, Secretaries General, uh, including Ban Ki-moon, uh, and currently, of course, serves as the spokesman for Antonio Guterres. Stefan knows the UN system inside and out. Uh, not, only, not only does he rock the mic at the UN podium day to day, uh, but he has run all of TV, radio, and photo for the UN uh, operation, and he also has led communications at the UN Development Program. Uh, his world travels started before his time at the UN, however, when he was a journalist with ABC News covering the globe. Of course, as noted, also a fellow Hoya and proud graduate of Georgetown School of Foreign Service. So, Stefan, over to you to open us up. Great, uh, Ben. Thank you very much, and you can uh, you can be my spokesperson anytime. Uh, Stuart, thank you for hosting us. Thank you for organizing this, and it's it's absolutely great to see you again, even though virtually after all these years, uh, whether at the UN and in the uh, in the halls at uh, at Georgetown. So uh, thanks again for for inviting me, and you know I want to spend a few minutes just talking about how we at the UN have adapted to this new reality. Now, of course, I can talk about the way the UN itself works, the secretary, the agencies, but I will let the, the distinguished diplomats, the three diplomats we have here on the panel, speak to the impact of their work on a more bilateral uh, basis. You know, the UN, just like any other organization, uh, any company with a public, public uh, private company, public organization, uh, we've had to adapt and do some crash learning in remote remote working uh, when the Secretary General took uh, the decision to shut down the campus in New York. And I'll just note that he took that decision rather early on in, in March, uh, before the city itself had begun to shut down. We shut down before museums, before Broadway and other public spaces. And he did it not only out of, out of an abundance of, uh, of caution, because we wanted to be good neighbors, but I think also politically, uh, the UN could not afford to become a hotspot within the hotspot that New York was fast becoming. And one can only imagine the, the headlines of, of our local tabloids if the UN had been responsible for bringing a lot of COVID cases in New York. And so almost overnight, we went from about 11,000 people coming into the campus every day, uh, delegates, uh, staff members, NGO, tourists, uh, to about 150 people. And now it's it's back up to about 200, 300 who come into the building every day. So the building remains basically empty. But I, you know, I can say proudly and maybe surprisingly to some that the Secretariat staff has met the challenge. You know, working like all of us, like a lot of other organizations working from, from living rooms, from kitchens uh, in New York and around the world, we've been able to continue to deliver the critical work uh, that the organization needs to deliver on and meet the challenges uh, of this crisis, which is really hitting all the core mandates of, that the UN has and, and really goes at the heart of, of what, what we are and who we are supposed, what we're supposed to do. You know, our peacekeeping operations, our special political missions have adapted to working under new conditions, uh, supporting the national authorities in the fight against the virus, in addition to uh, delivering on their critical functions. Um, our, you know, 100,000 peacekeepers or tens of thousands of humanitarian workers are not in lockdown. Uh, they're in the field uh, working every day. And their work continues to be supported uninterrupted from headquarters. In addition, our country offices, which exist in about 166 places around the world, are also working with local governments to help put in place uh, policies to help stem uh, the virus and support the post-COVID uh, recovery. You know, as an example, we, the Secretary General really rallied the UN's global supply chain and it's been put at the, um, at the disposal of developing countries and middle-income countries. I mean, in a lot of parts of the African continent, uh, the UN planes are the only ones flying, uh, delivering 
uh, personal protective devices, surgical masks, respirators, uh, basic commodities. Uh, and we've reached now globally about 100 countries. Now, how we work, I think for, for the leadership uh, from the, and especially for the Secretary General, it's been all hands on deck because not only, um, not only because of the pandemic, but of the global diplomatic fallout from this pandemic, or you know, if I were to use a more precise word, the dysfunctionality of the international scene that has emerged as a result of the pandemic. Um, so the Secretary General, he does come into to the office and works, uh, works from his office by phone, by video conference. Um, I don't think he misses traveling to summits and you know, other official conferences, though, of course, as we all know, very important work goes on uh, in these conferences, especially, I would say, on the sidelines. I think what's been taken away from him is his ability to go to the field, which is where I've always seen him at his most invigorated and in, at his happiest, and not, not because he enjoys tragedy, but because it is an amazing opportunity for him to engage with the people that we are here to help, the people who benefit from the UN's humanitarian development work. And it's also a chance for him to interact uh, with our colleagues who are in the front line. So that, that has been taken away. And I think that's a, it's, a big, um, it's, it's, it's a big thing that's been taken away from him and I think has, uh, has not been a positive impact. Now, obviously, um, the lockdown has had an impact on how we work at, at headquarters and how we support uh, multilateral meetings and the member states or the legislative bodies that work at the UN. But I think after some technical challenges like we have all faced, uh, we're now able to support regular meetings of the Security Council, the General Assembly, the Economic and Social Council, um, both um, virtually and, and sometimes in person. The Security Council met in person for the first time uh, earlier uh, this week. The big challenge for us has been on the IT side um, because we have issues of interpretation, uh, IT safety. I think it's easy to imagine the reluctance of some of our member states uh, for in installing external software on the computers of their ambassadors and their and their diplomats, um, you know. And the headline, the, the title of this talk is Zoom Dip Zoom diplomacy, uh, but um, the meetings that we've been hosting, whether General Assembly, Security Council, or in fact not hosted on Zoom, we are not. We've been discouraged from using Zoom, so we're using other uh, other platforms. So, you know, in the sense, the, 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 on the formal part of the work that we have to do, delivering on humanitarian, peacekeeping, political missions, hosting member state meetings, we've risen, <clears throat> excuse me, we've risen to the challenge uh, posed by the lockdown. I think the, the more difficult part is on the informal part of our work. And, and you know, it's been, a, that's been a big challenge, um, you know, Speaking personally, in order for me to do my work uh, successfully as a spokesperson, I really have to be a journalist within the organization, uh, asking unpleasant questions of my colleagues, trying to squeeze information from a bureaucracy to meet the needs of my clients who are the journalists. And so I still have my daily uh, meetings with the Secretary General, obviously on, on video conference most of the time, and we're in touch as needed. But what I can't do anymore, what's missing for me is my ability to basically roam the halls of the building, pop in my head into people's offices and get a sense of what's actually going on and the trends and the discussions that people may, are having on a much more informal basis. And the same applies to our resident journalists. We have about 200 journalists that are accredited full-time to the UN who have their offices here. And the way they gather, they gather information is on a, in normal times is to hang out outside the Security Council, to buttonhole ambassador, have a coffee with a diplomat in the delegates lounge. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's important to kind of imagine the UN campus on the East River as a, a sort of a unique biosphere that's populated with UN staff, national diplomats, NGOs, 
um, and of course, journalists. And the journalists are sort of the, the pollinator bees of the biosphere. And so the lockdown has stopped this sort of informal pollination of information. And we've all had to adapt it. Now, I know ambassadors who used to do um, in-person, off-the-record uh, briefing to journalists are doing them by video conference and by Zoom or whatever platform, but it's still, it's not the same as an in-person uh, in chat. Now, the other challenge that we face, I, I think is a mental health issue for our staff. You know, by the very nature of the UN and, and the kind of people that work at the UN, we have many colleagues who are in New York uh, alone, sometimes far away from family uh, and friends. Some of them arrived just before the lockdown. Um, and I think Ben, in, in, in our conversations, as you put it, they're far away from home, but stuck at home. And so as managers, uh, we have a big responsibility to check in on the staff, to make sure their mental health is okay, to make sure they are feeling included in the work uh, that we do. And that, I think as this lockdown will continue, that will become a growing challenge uh, for us. So our focus now uh, for the UN as a whole is on preparing for the General Assembly in September, the high level week, which will be nothing uh, like, uh, like we've had in the past, obviously. It, it will be in fact, mostly virtual. Uh, heads of states will uh, send in video messages, which will be broadcast in the General Assembly Hall. We expect to have maybe one representative from each country sitting physically in the hall. So there will be a physical presence. The Secretary General will likely deliver his message live uh, from, from the podium. So very few side events. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be a brand new world, but I think we, we uh, as the Secretariat will uh, continue to work hard to support the member states in, in their efforts to organize the General Assembly and will continue to adapt our ways of working in order to successfully uh, fulfill our global mandate. So I will leave it at that, Ben, and I'm happy to take uh, questions from you and, and from any of the other participants. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Stefan. And I found this, as, as much as I feel I know the UN and the hallways and corridors, the picture you just painted was extremely riveting and, um, and informative. As you noted, uh, large institutions, bureaucracies, uh, uh, companies of all sizes, uh, we're all facing very similar um, challenges and finding ways to, to adapt. Um, indeed, uh, I'm looking at the Q&A function and also to our uh, panelists who uh, I know have not been introduced yet, but if anyone has a question, uh, please uh, float it. In the meantime, um, Stefan, I, I'm quite taken by your description of the biosphere on the East River um, and noting that uh, one of the first considerations as the uh, gravity of COVID started to, to sink in was that uh, the Secretary General uh, viewed the UN as a part of the New York City community. Um, so uh, I, that duality of both being this contained biosphere, but also a part, a neighbor, a resident of New York, I think is so important to remember. Um, you also talked about just taking care of staff as managers um, and whether that's a small diplomatic mission or a large uh, institution like your own. C could you share with us, and, and you don't need to name names per se, but where have you seen some of the more innovative or ingenious approaches to uh, any of the above, managing staff or creating informal moments when the normal uh, opportunities aren't there? H have you seen examples from the, the last couple of months in your circles where you thought, oh, this is something that was uh, an innovative approach that, that might be worth sharing with others? Well, I, you know, I think it, it's, it, we've all gone through phases, I think in our professional and our personal lives, you know, in the beginning, it was kind of fun. You had the quarantinis and all of that. And then that kind of gets, uh, gets old. So to me, it's, I mean, at least speaking for me, it's about the, cons it's about consistent contact. I think in the beginning, we we're all trying to have Zoom calls all the time. But for me, how I manage uh, the staff is really to try to check to do a couple of group check-ins a day to keep people motivating. I mean, I, in order to be successful in, in getting the, the daily press briefing, it's a, it's, it's a full teamwork and I, I don't do it alone. 
And so it's, it's very important to, to check in with the staff twice a day, to check in individually with people. If you see a staff member that's kind of lagging for whatever reason, to reach out to people individually, to make sure they're, they're doing okay. Uh, I think everybody is struggling, whether they're living alone or in close quarters with a large family. It's, it's a struggle in, in terms of figuring out what's personal time, what's work time, and we're, we're all, you know, we're all learning. Um, so to me, it's really about, I, I mean, maybe others have, been, maybe others have been very uh, innovative, but for me, it's really about consistency and making sure, uh, I mean, to use a quote that's too often used, you leave no one behind in your team, in a sense. We have a couple of questions now from our, uh, our audience, and I'll do my best to maybe synthesize a little bit, um, Stefan. You have talked about operational changes, procedure, um, in light of the adaptation that's going on, um, what changes do you think might stick? That is to say that should we see light at the end of the tunnel and some resumption of normal procedures, what, what operational changes or what procedures do you think um, might um, stay or any reformulation of procedures that might stay with us uh, uh, over the long term? I think one thing- Regarding is, plan operations, sorry. Sorry, I think one thing is probably a drop in travel. I mean, there will be travel that resumes, but I think it's clear now that a lot of the travel, probably that we've all done uh, for professional basis could have been, um, is a bit redundant, right? So I, I imagine there'll be less uh, th there will be less, uh, less travel and, and hopefully a streamlining of procedures and also using the collaborative software, you know, we've all been given in different organization that has worked out very well. I mean, for, at least from, from my, from my end. And I think, uh, really bringing organizations into the 21st, uh, into the 21st century in how we collaborate um, in order to get things done. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, I have a feeling we'll pick up that, that theme in the panel as well. Um, let's do one more question specifically for you. And I want to remind everyone that you will be, uh, uh, and thank you for having the time, you'll be joining the panel as well so we can continue this, uh, this line of conversation. We have a question regarding the SDGs uh, and the goal of uh, 2030. Given all the disruption that we have seen I know there's been discussion about environmental targets and, and, and so on. When it comes to the SDGs as a whole, what are the expectations uh, about meeting them? And specifically, and again, I think this is something we can also pick up on the panel, where can the private sector come in and perhaps provide some accelerant or, or, or uh, support when it comes to uh, 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 the achievement of the SDGs? Look, uh this could be a whole hour discussion, but to put it very, very simply, we're extremely worried because even before this, it was clear that some indicators would not be met. But, you know, the, the COVID has laid bare the inequalities of this world, things that we, a lot of us suspected, but the curtain has been lifted. Um, you look at issues, I mean, I'll just pick, choose two of them on, um, on, on education. Uh, it is clear that with so many students not being able to go to school, when schools reopen in places in, 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 in the, within the framework of an economic crisis, a lot of children will not go back to school. It's clear that of those children who won't go back to school, most likely the girls will not go back to school. So that will have an impact on, on education and girls, uh, and, you know, on education as a whole, on, on women's empowerment. Women, women's education. On the, climate, uh, on the climate issue, we're really at a crossroads. I think we've all benefited and enjoyed the clear blue skies. Um, what the Secretary General is doing is pushing for all these financial packages that, will, that are, are being designed, whether in the developing world or in the developed world, that we use this opportunity not to double up on coal, not to double up on fossil fuel, but to really go deep, deep into, uh, into green uh, investment, into renewable uh, energies. So, you know, those are two that will have, uh, we could see a very 
we, we have, we're at the risk of seeing a negative impact. But I think across the SDGs, we're worried on, on issues of human rights. Uh, I mean, you're looking at you know the surveillance that, be, that is being put in place um, uh, for for tracing that could be used uh, for for nefarious uh, purposes. We're seeing a lot of countries where uh, freedom of speech, uh, the the space for civil uh, for for NGO civil society is being shrunk, all in the name of fighting uh, COVID. So we have to make sure that the recovery pushes us in the right uh, in the right direction. To put it uh, simply, the private sector is a huge role to play because governments a can't do it alone, uh, just as a matter as a, as a matter of fact, and don't have the resources to do it alone. So it's important that the private sector plays its role in terms of investing in the right way for the recovery. Thanks, that was a Herculean effort, I know, to distill what, as you pointed out, could be a whole separate conversation. So uh, Meridian friends, let's take a note. Maybe that's the, the follow on. Uh, we have questions from others, including old friend, Michael, Sophia, I know your hand is up. If you'll allow me, let's bring in the other panelists. Uh, I'll do brief introductions, hold your questions, and let's see if we can uh, visit those then. Um, so uh, on that score, uh, let me uh, start by introducing uh, Jerry Diaz Bartolome, uh, a fellow RLC member. Jerry, good to see you. Uh, though you're wearing a tie, you're making me feel very formal here. But thanks for holding up the style points for our crew. Uh, uh, a career diplomat since 2000, uh, deputy chief of mission at the Embassy of Argentina. Currently, uh, it, I was going to say here in Washington, but in Washington D.C. Uh, between stints in Brazil and Buenos Aires, uh, Jerry also served at the Mission of Argentina to the United Nations and also knows Stefan from those days. So it is a small diplomatic world. Uh, our other panelist, fellow RLC member, Ren Paulson, who since 2017 has served as the Deputy Chief of Mission and Defense Attaché at the Embassy of Iceland in Washington, DC, with the Icelandic Ministry of Foreign Affairs since 2005, uh, has served in uh, such far-flung places as Reykjavik, Shanghai, Moscow, and Norfolk, Virginia. Um, uh, and they all featured in his diplomatic journeys. And last but certainly not least uh, for this segment of our discussion, my co-conspirator in uh, the ideation and planning of this event, uh, Kizia McKaig, uh, who is currently director uh, at McClarty Associates, uh, advising clients on uh, may I say all things Latin America, but specifically Argentina and Cuba. Uh, up until a few months ago was really splitting her time between Argentina and Washington. I know longs to go back uh, to uh, um, what is probably a, a second home uh, advising multinational companies across a range of sectors. Uh, prior to McClarty, uh, served at the Council of the Americas on the staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and fun fact, her family hails from Cuba and New Zealand. So thank you for joining the conversation. Uh, I will immediately launch uh, into some starter questions uh, and let's go back to uh, the top. Uh, Jerry, um, when, when in Washington uh, on the diplomatic circuit, uh, the Embassy of Argentina and the Embassy of Iceland among others uh, features prominently for all the cultural programming uh, that you and your team have been doing. Um, what has it been like to translate that programming to a virtual setting now? Uh, uh, you've been making some great headway. Um, and then what is the difference between planning that versus a traditional bilateral meeting? How have you been making that transition for your embassy? Well, uh, thank you very much, man. Hi to my RLC colleagues, Stefan and um, Basel Hall. Thank you for hosting us. Well, we, we, we had to adapt. Uh, many of the issues I was planning to deal with have been raised by Stepan, uh, even from a bilateral perspective. We share most of those same challenges. And, uh, and when the embassy team, we came to the conclusion that due to the pandemic, the, nothing is the same and nothing will be the same in the near future. So we had to go digital. Uh, and we had many staff meetings to discuss the available platforms we had, uh, the programs, designing tools. Uh, we got them. We got great support from our Ministry of Foreign Affairs to acquire those uh, new elements, digital tools. 
Uh, we practiced a lot. We did mock events to rehearse, and uh, we started redesigning our whole programs, the cultural program, for example, online. We came up with a very interesting online cultural program. Uh, I would differentiate basically between two big kinds of diplomacies, the traditional bilateral official government to government uh, meetings uh, online are basically, of course, they are different. There are many aspects which are not the same, but conversations may still be conversations. Even if you, if you don't have the personal feel or the sidelines, or uh, you still can pass on messages. Of course, there are some constraints like the lack of, of the records or the, 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 as I said, the personal feel. But uh, that is workable, uh, always in the hope that you will finally end up seeing your interlocutor in the near future. Of course, it's uh, much easier to have these bilateral meetings with people you are acquainted with than building up uh, a new relationship uh, from scratch. Uh, but as far as uh, the other kinds of diplomacies, uh, cultural, commercial, uh, the challenge was uh, bigger because uh, a great deal of uh, cultural diplomacy has to do with the again the personal feel uh, the, the, the gathering in our embassy for a concert tango lessons or wine tasting or a film festival the, the personal meeting is key that's where you have the connections and uh, you meet uh, you chat with a i don't know a movie director or a curator and you can uh, interest them in your country your culture and uh, think ahead well, without that, it, it, we had to adapt. And uh, we've been pretty successful. We even had, um, of course, it's not the same to have tango lessons in person at our beautiful embassy building than have them online, but we could still make them, make that. And uh, we had uh, many premieres on uh, very interesting Argentine movies online, and people are actually eager to, to see what the program brings. Commercial diplomacy may be also challenging, of course, depending on which angle you're working with. You can always come up with a webinar to promote the tourism gems of Argentina or uh, how our companies are doing in robotics and uh, try to sell Argentina in, in those fields. But uh, wine tastings are not the same. Uh, we still pay them, but we, you need to spot a retailer or a wine distributor first to make sure that they will you know, give the proper wines to the stakeholders and the consumers get them in time so that we can have the winery representative online at a certain time to explain and walk the audience through very slowly and uh, without that personal feel where you see their faces, their, expre their expressions. Uh, so it, it's been very challenging, but we, we, we've been doing a great deal of, uh, of events and uh, modestly we've gone digital and pretty successfully, I must say. Thanks, Jerry. I appreciate that. And, and if I can pull a couple threads from what you said and actually pass the mic to Kizia, uh, it seems like a natural extension. Um, one of the things Jerry talked about was the, in many respects, high touch nature of diplomacy. Kizia, so much of, Kizia, so much of your work involves interacting directly with clients, helping them interface with governments. How do you adapt to that situation? What kind of advice would one give uh, in this current uh, environment that we're in? Yeah, well, thank you so much. It's great to be on here with good friends. You know, look, we're, we're learning as we go. Just as the pandemic has forced new constraints on the conduct of traditional diplomacy, so it has on the government affairs profession or how companies engage with governments. The private sector can't meet with government officials in person. We can't make foreign trips. We can't organize in-person events. The bread and butter of what is really a face-to-face -face business. Speaking from my vantage point at McClarty Associates, which is a global strategy firm that was a real pioneer in the field of private sector diplomacy when it was founded more than 20 years ago, uh, we, we do a range of services for clients in diverse sectors, including intel gathering and political analysis, strategy development and execution, helping clients in more than 112 countries all over the world. Um, so in the first few weeks of the pandemic, we were probably working harder than ever. We were helping our clients respond to just this incredible pace of external political and regulatory developments from, you know, factories being shut down to definitions of essential versus uh, non-essential businesses, new export controls and trade restrictions across key markets, the disruption of supply chains, 
helping with evacuation of key personnel. But after that real initial rush of firefighting kind of work, I for, personally struggled a little bit to stay connected in the same way I had before the pandemic. And some governments, foreign governments, were slower than others to engage online, understandably so given the unprecedented challenges, the crisis management we were all dealing with. The, some of the traditional tools of private sector diplomacy we're still using, right? So associations, business associations have adapted very rapidly with virtual events, though I would say that I think some of them are struggling to uh, recruit sponsorship from the private sector. So they may be struggling financially in the future uh, because companies may be less interested in, in providing funding for, for a virtual roundtable. While those roundtables are still very useful, they're much more scripted. I actually just got off an hour long meeting with an Argentine minister, for example, and my question was posed to him, but it was posed by the president of the association and there was no interaction back and forth that, that would have occurred if I had been seated at a table with him in person. So what's more challenging, I think, as this has been a theme of our conversation, is what typically gets done on the margins and the corridors. You can't do a pull aside uh, for a meeting virtually like you would in an in-person round table. Um, well, I was somebody who found that I wasn't really doing my job well if I was on the computer all day. I was out getting coffees. I like spending a lot of time on the ground, particularly in Buenos Aires, since I specialize in Argentina, uh, getting coffees with government officials, gathering intelligence. All of that was extremely useful to the work I was doing uh, with clients in a variety of sectors. Um, what I, something I have noticed is that while we can maintain relationships that pre-existed the pandemic, it's much harder to build new relationships. So those who work in Latin America, for example, know that a lot of work can get done very effectively on WhatsApp. So if I already know, have a relationship with a government official and can send a quick WhatsApp message, it's so much more efficient. If I don't already have that relationship, it's going to be very difficult to build from my living room in Washington. Well, another tool that the private sector has always used in engaging with governments is leveraging international meetings. So we've already talked about the upcoming UN General Assembly, which will be virtual for the first time in 75 years. And in past years, every September, I and, and a lot of company representatives would flock to New York. It was one of the busiest weeks of the year because of all the sideline events that took place, hosted by think tanks, government associations, all the bilateral meetings that took place between companies and heads of state that traveled to New York. That we're trying to figure out how we're with a lot of our clients, how are we going to still in some way take advantage of UNGA, this virtual UNGA, what that will look like. In some cases for companies, it's being creative about thought leadership. So sponsoring a virtual round table about a, around a particular topic. There are some associations that are doing major virtual fora, but it's, it's a challenge. So as I said, we're learning as we go. There's a quote I like by the renowned journalist and war correspondent Edward Murrow, which says the really crucial link in the international communication chain is the last three feet, which is bridged by personal contact, one person talking to another. So the question is, how effectively will we continue to do that in, with our new normal? That's a great note to uh, uh, hand off. I, I, I will say to to Ren, though perhaps we now have an update to the Murrow quote, which is the last three feet as long as you're wearing a mask. Um, <laughs> Ren, so many themes touched on here that I know you and and the uh, and the foreign ministry have been looking at. Um, let's pretend, Ren, uh, no one else is on the screen here that we don't have over a hundred folks tuning in. Just just lean your ear into me a second. How do we figure out? Um, navigating diplomacy when so much is set off the record these days, when uh, uh, we're worried that if we're, you know, on, on a Zoom together, other people might be listening. Stefan touched on this a little bit. Um, what, have you, what, what have your studies and your journeys through this been about that, you know, what, what Kizia said is that informal contact. Um, what's the state of play when it comes to 
what can we say in confidence and what really can't we say in confidence? I uh, thank you for, for having me and, and thank you uh, to Stefan and Ambassador Holiday and, and the ILC members and everybody who's tuning in. Uh, it's an interesting question and, uh, and I think uh, we, in one of our preparatory uh, discussions uh, for, for this event, uh, I think Stefan, uh, uh, quote Stefan, that he said, you know, everything is on the record when you're going through this meeting, when you're going through the, the, the Zoom, you really can't have anything off the record. You don't know who's looking, you don't know who's recording. It is, it, you, uh, I've, I work with a lot of the politics, I work a lot of the security issues uh, while here in DC. And so many of my conversations through the Zoom end with a quote, well, I'll tell you over a cup of coffee a little bit later, you know, what I actually you know the background to all, all of this is. We can't, that, that is the hindrance. And, and a lot of uh, what we do as diplomats is to add uh, uh, sort of context to a lot of things that are going on. Uh, my ambassadors uh, have said, I, you know, we don't write reports back home about the political situation in the United States. You know, the Washington Post writes very good reports about the political situation in the United States, and everybody can read it on, you know, in, in, on every day in, in the media. What we do is provide the background. And the background, you get the background from the personal conversations, from the private conversations that you can you know, say, you know, we had a discussion with a Biden person, we had a discussion with a Trump person, and, and they told us that this is the, you know, this is where they're going with this. This is the, the, the reason for this policy being enacted. This is the context. This is the added value that we give uh, uh, to our to our capitals for to understand better what's going on, to be able to take better decisions and more informed decisions. And unfortunately, under the current circumstances, this is very difficult. Uh, you, you are on the record when you're talking. Uh, you can sort of give hints and nods and, 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 and winks uh, to, to, to guide you along with this thing. So that's, that's it, 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 you can, as my fellow, fellow uh, panelists have mentioned, you can have open discussions and even more close discussions and, and more frequent discussions with, with the, the people uh, that you are already acquainted with, that you already have a network with, but they are still going to be limited. There are security issues uh, by using this kind of medium. So, so that, there is no way getting around it, uh, around it at the moment. And uh, I, you know, there is, th th this is the deficient, deficiency that we have to try to work with. Mm -hmm. Brent, th thanks very much. Uh, I, I know we have a few really trenching questions that uh, have been sent in from uh, places far and wide. Um, and we have one other speaker we're going to bring on now, and that is Violet Skiva, um, uh, to introduce a topic that I think uh, really needs to be uh, covered. Um, and then we will um, go to the queue of questions for the full panel. Violet, thank you so much for joining us. Um, by way of quick introduction, Violet Skiva uh, works as the first secretary for political and economic affairs at the Embassy of Malawi in Washington. Uh, recipient of Meridian's Scholarship for Global Leaders in Digital Finance, uh, you studied at the Harvard School of Government, which as a Princeton person, I'll still say, very good thing uh, to have done. A uh, little uh, Ivy League humor there. Um, uh, your background before being a diplomat is you worked in the banking sector in Malawi and for the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. And just picking up on that background that you bring to the conversation, can we talk about access to technology for a moment? One of the things that um, even the, the premise of our meeting uh, implies is having uh, the basic tools to conduct conversations in diplomacy via Zoom or RAN, what's the title of the report, any other Cisco, WebEx, uh, 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 Microsoft platform. Uh, but that presumes a lot. Um, and it, it, it's important, and, and frankly, it's something we're looking at from the lens of higher education. And that is, in a certain way, and this I'm looking at the questions we receive from some people, digital diplomacy can level the playing field a lot. In other ways, it, it can uh, highlight or uh, uh, exacerbate inequality. Would you mind picking up a little on that uh, for what you've seen, uh, the, the challenges and opportunities in this so-called move to digital diplomacy. Oh, thank you so much, Ben, and thank you, uh, Meridian, for having me uh, on this conversation. Um, first is um, when we talk about digital uh, diplomacy, to me, I think it's a move from uh, traditional diplomacy because traditionally when, when you're conducting meetings, you want to have that personal conversation, uh, the informal 
conversation with, with your counterparts or partners. Uh, normally, when you are trying to agree on, on how to forge ahead uh, with a, a certain issue, you may want to talk to your friend, maybe over coffee, and find out uh, their perspective and agree on how you want to go ahead together. So in an online meeting, you don't have that chance. So it's really difficult to conduct uh, uh, meetings uh, digital, uh, digitally uh, uh, as a diplomat. But again, um, uh, what, what I found uh, interesting in this uh, digital environment is that we had elections in Malawi and um, the international observers could not fly into the country. So uh, it's, this is a function that you cannot conduct online. You have to be on the ground to observe uh, what is happening with the elections. So I found that uh, it was the resident diplomats in Malawi that we relied upon to observe the elections and report back to their various uh, countries on, on what was happening on the ground in Malawi. Um, yeah, maybe stop, maybe stop there for now. I know there's a, a lot more to unpack there, but thank you for reminding us that much of diplomacy uh, has no other option than to occur in person and on the ground. And the uh, notion of elect election observation is an important reminder. Um, so thanks for all the panelists for staying on. I, I, I realize the clock is ticking. So let me try to summarize a few of the questions that we've received. Um, and flipping the switch a little bit on the idea of, of what can be said on or off the record, is there an element where this notion of Zoom diplomacy, online diplomacy can actually be a force multiplier for transparency or trust, either in multilateral institutions or in the conduct of bilateral or commercial diplomacy? Um, and, and I, I want to bring in a question about civil society as well in a second, but let's take that uh, issue of, of of being a force multiplier for transparency in this digital environment. Who, who would like to take that? I, I step in. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Well, there's, uh, the, 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 the notion that transparency would not be involved otherwise. Uh, that, that is the only thing that made me think uh, that uh, at the same time, uh, I'm fully aware of the drawbacks and constraints that my colleagues were mentioning and the off the record part of this Zoom diplomacy and the constraints we face. Uh, I mean, there's no personal touch, no no face-to-face -face contact. But uh, transparency, as I see it, should be something which is beyond the digital diplomacy or not. It is part of our work. Some conversations need to be uh, restricted. Uh, for different purposes, political reasons, but it's not a, I wouldn't define it as a, a transparent, transparency versus non-transparency issue, perhaps. The option is not related to transparency necessarily. Uh, the, the way I, I, I would agree. Oh, no, please, Stefan. No, sir, I would agree with you. It, it, Zoom can give a, a false sense of transparency, right? Um, and so it, it's it doesn't, it, it doesn't. Uh, it, it it's it could be good or bad, but it's it's it. I think it it can give a, a false impression that we're being more transparent because everything's being done on 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 Zoom. The point is, there's still side conversations being had. We just find other ways to skirt the transparency. Oh, we don't. One could. <laughs> We have a question from, uh, in full transparency, a dear friend, Christy Edwards, who's with the OSCE Office, of Demo Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights in Poland. Thanks for tuning in, despite the time difference. And, and, and it maybe builds a little bit on what we were just discussing. Um, uh, often we uh, can leverage conversations with other sectors to provide us the information and insights. So um, for embassies and multilateral organizations, have we been able to maintain conversations and access to civil society organizations who often provide information about the issues facing communities? Uh, so I, I open that up uh, to, to uh, any of you here, but how has it been working? And Violet, you touched on, on the very fundamental role of elections. Um, you know, how have been our interactions with civil society organizations in this era? 
Well, maybe I can uh, sort of say that, you know, from, from my perspective sitting here in Washington, D.C., I think the civil society, uh, academia, think tanks have uh, uh, adapted quite quickly to the change circumstances. So interactions through the Zoom diplomacy have actually made it easier to, to attend uh, lectures, to talk to people. You can squeeze things in, you know, you're, sometimes you sit at the computer for five, ten, five hours straight listening to, to, to all kinds of interesting discussions and you, and you get involved. And, and, and I think civil society has been part of that, think tanks, like I said, and the academia. So there is, this is, makes it easier for us to, to congregate uh, from various distances to, to talk about things and, and, and share information. That is in the open, open, open. Uh, that is in the open. So that is that has been one of the good things that has that we can point to uh, in, in this respect. I think. Yeah, I, I think for um, in terms of of the way we work at the UN, I would it, it kind of has the opposite effect. Just I think the way I describe journalists and their lack of access, the same can be said of civil society, which you know most of the big. <clears throat> Uh, human rights group or other civil society organizations have UN represent, uh, representatives who also have access to the building, who also have the ability to buttonhole diplomats to have informal discussions. So the loss of the, of the biosphere also impacts civil society organizations uh, as well as journalists. Uh, but if you allow me, I, I agree with you. And, uh... As far as your society groups on specific issues are concerned, the audience is much larger now. Because yeah. as we used to do an event at the embassy, of course, we sometimes we stream, we, we did streaming, but these days we've had events on well, the LGBT month in, our, in, in Washington DC or a specific cycle uh, for women empowerment last uh, May, March. And uh, it was amazing because it, we had uh, interested people not only from the United States, which is our main uh, interlocutor, but or Argentina, but some other countries. And that was something unprecedented. We hadn't had that experience before. And we still had Zoom or these digital platforms, but we were, we were not aware of how useful they could be. So that, that's a very positive, actually, impact of this. And I can, I can give you a, 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 an example of, of how going online, it's, it's not a civil society interaction, but it tells you, you know, what we can do and how things can change the dynamics with, with uh, using going online. The Nordic uh, embassies here in Washington DC have an annual Nordic Jazz Festival. Mm. Beautiful festival, we had it for many years. We uh, have events at the embassies. You have a hundred, couple of hundred people who come and listen to our, you know, the nice musicians from the Nordic countries. This wasn't able, to, we weren't able to do this this year. So we went online. So instead of a couple of hundred people being able to enjoy and sort of experience the aesthetic music, we had tens of thousands of people uh, tuning into the concerts online. So the audience was much greater. And that sort of because everybody is stuck at home, stuck at the computer, you know, there is, you know, you're not roaming around, everybody is in the same situation. So, so that the audience is a captive audience to a degree that you can uh, tune into. So under the circumstances, I think that has been one of the one, uh, benefit. To, it has been a false force multiplier in many ways, at least in this example and uh, the cultural sphere. Uh, I would just add from uh, the uh, uh, small corner of higher ed that, that I sit in that it's given us uh, here uh, in Princeton an opportunity to look at programming that stretches across or involves partners from across uh, our partners in New Jersey higher ed um, and to uh, create conversations and interactions that we normally may not have thought of uh, when it was just all about having people come to a, a campus uh, kind of tucked away um, in the countryside here. So. Uh, that's been a good projection of, of kind of our expertise, but also sort of the values and priorities that we see that are being uh, tested at this time uh, across uh, education and sharing that conversation with schools that we might normally partner with, which has been a lot of fun. If I can, and I know we're reaching uh, near our time, though I I'm hoping the panelists will indulge for a couple extra minutes. Um, Violet, I wanted to uh, bring a question to you because I know one of the important facets of your job is to deal with the uh, uh, diaspora of Malawi uh, here in the United States. Um, this has been a tough time, uh, whatever your nationality. And one of your jobs is, um, I think, uh, often involves providing support. Stefan talked about being managers and offering support to our teams. Uh, this takes it an, another step. Uh, would you mind discussing that a little bit for us and how you've uh, had to grapple with that challenge? Oh, um yeah, first, uh, the Malawi diaspora has uh, really been um, engaged uh, with people back home 
And in this era, there's been a lot of um, uh, deaths going on. So it's the diaspora here who have to help uh, through remittances, but also they have been uh, asking for support in various ways. And um, it uh, has really taken a toll on the embassy as a whole to, to support them. But uh, it has been really an interesting uh, uh, space to, to go through with them, um, to engage them uh, on, on whatever they, they needed to want uh, to uh, support from the embassy in general. So, um, but it has been interesting to see uh, them wanting to connect with people back home and uh, as you, as I'll go back to the access of uh, internet, it has been a challenge for people back home to also connect with the diaspora here because uh, uh, internet is not uh, easily accessible accessible with, with them. But emotionally for, for me, it has, it has been a challenge uh, as a diplomat, yeah. Thanks for that. And I, I think that that resonates with, the, uh, like I said, um, what Stefan had voiced earlier. And I think all of us are, are trying to pull together um, as best we can for our communities, wherever they may be. Um, we are at time. We still have a, a good number of folks still tuned in. So maybe we can end with a, a question that Keanu had sent in and, and remind reminds us that we are a, a uh, organized under the auspices of the Rising Leaders Council. What kind of Council of a different sort can we provide regarding the diplomatic landscape for young professionals, recent graduates, so that speaks a little bit to my heart being in higher ed now, um, in this virtual atmosphere. So if you want to pursue a career in diplomacy or, or commercial diplomacy, um, multilateral, what, uh, you know, what piece of advice would we give somebody who's looking to uh, go down to this, this path at a time when the normal networking opportunities might not be there? I'll let you chew on that for a second, but I'm trying to see whose head's nodding the most. It might be Jerry's. Mm -hmm. So Jerry, let me toss for a quick answer and then maybe one or two others. Uh, end us on a positive note. Well, uh, go on. I'm afraid of uh, diplo digital diplomacy. Uh, of course, Zoom diplomacy is the new normal for the time being, but personal diplomacy will not disappear. Actually, it will be very healthy that both coexist and that we have to cope with that. And it is very positive. There are many good aspects to it. Uh, of course, the concept of soft power in international relations will change. Uh, there might be, of course, a digital divide, but also a generational divide we have to be aware of. But in the end, I think it's a very positive change, as long as we recover the traditional diplomatic code of conduct and we can make them coincide with this new world, which opens up lots of opportunities. We shouldn't be afraid of this. I like that. Stefan, uh, in, in, in true UN fashion, I will just say, I agree with what the previous speaker said. <laughs> well said. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, I, I think the, the, the personal contacts will, will, not, uh, will not go away. And, and I think it's, it's, a false, um, it, it's a false idea to, th to think that we will just rely on these, uh, on, on these tools uh, to do our work. So I, I think the, the advice is double down on investing on personal, in personal contacts. Kizi, uh, I'm wondering, you know, we talked about established relationships versus developing new ones, but if you're a young professional entering your field or, or others, what do you think about a, a, a cold call or a introductory email these days, whether to transact business or do an informational interview? How, how does that sound? Do you think that passes muster? Yeah, you know, it's something I've thought a lot about the next generation of policymakers or people in my field. It's a little harder to start out right now, but I've also given talks to recent graduates about this very topic. And I think, you know, like as others have said, everybody is very busy, but also sitting at home. And I think um, always a personal, if you can get introduced to somebody via a personal contact, that's better than a cold call. But often folks are very receptive because they know that recent graduates are not only inhibited by an inability to network, but also by a deep recession produced by the pandemic. So 
think um, it, very much, you know, the advice I always give is informational interviews, informational interviews, and, and that remains the same. And I think you can do that digitally, even if somebody doesn't want to meet up for a socially distanced coffee at the moment. Violet or Ren, you want to add to any of that as a parting piece of advice for our uh, viewers? Well, I think I can agree with uh, Vikisia, you know, I think uh, in this rela this relates basically you know, the same as maybe in the dating game when you when we were younger, uh, you know, mutual acquaintances are probably a strength in this, this situation. Uh, call call, maybe not so much, but, but a mutual acquaintance would be helpful. And I think uh, also it, uh, the, the current situation just beyond the just meeting uh, uh, contacts is, it just reminds us uh, the, the how being a diplomat means that you need to be multifaceted. You need to be able to jump into all kinds of situations. You need to learn on your feet. And uh, that is true now. You know, I've been having, you know, to move into being uh, videotaping addresses for the with the ambassador, uh, uh, trying to learn all the different programs that we have to use, whether it's Teams, it's uh, Zoom, it's, it's, it's uh, FaceTime, it's, it's uh, you know, number of all kinds of programs just for communication, but also for, for information sharing, you're jumping in through the WhatsApp over to OneNotes. So you have to be uh, adaptable. And I think that's my key advice to be to young future diplomats. You have to be adaptable. You have to be uh, you know, willing to, to learn on the go. That's usually what, 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 what is the, a good advice for diplomats and a good, good sort of uh, attitude to have. Mm -hmm. Violet, I see you're nodding your head also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with him. <laughs> yeah, so uh, as a young diplomat, as uh, it has already been said before, you need to be multifaceted and also to work on your skills uh, um, to fit in every situation because you never know where you get thrown into. And especially when you are working in a, uh, in a way away from home, how you find your feet on the ground and you, so you need to be prepared. So uh, emotionally, physically, you need to work on, on how you are able to manage situation, emergencies, because so many things happen that you never get taught in class. So it, it's really important to be able to, to learn on yourself, to develop yourself, to have that skill to know what to do when you are not even told what to do. So. That, that is a very important thing that uh, every young diplomat should learn. Well, this has been great. I think it's fodder for uh, another session, perhaps. I'm glad to see some folks are still with us. Uh, two parting notes. Uh, Gloria writes, uh, how do we keep in touch with everybody? Um, and I, I have not mastered Zoom enough, Gloria, to figure out how to just uh, send you a, a direct message. So what I'll say is my email, and then if others uh, uh, if you review requests for others, you can reach them through me, but my email is ben.chang at princeton.edu. Uh, I want to thank everyone who's tuned in. I want to thank all the panelists. Stefan, I'd like to thank you specifically for kicking us off. And of course, Meridian International, Megan Devlin, Ambassador Stuart Holiday. Finally, a, a closing note from our sponsor. Um, programs like this one today are only possible with your support. Uh, as many as you know, of you know, Meridian is a nonprofit organization that has also been impacted by the COVID pandemic. One way you can help sustain Meridian's work is to strengthen. One way you can help sustain Meridian's work to strengthen engagement between the United States and the world is by joining the Meridian Council, a distinguished network of leaders in Washington and around the country, engaging more broadly with Meridian's diplomatic, cultural, and global leadership programs. Meridian will be sending around more information about the council and other ways to support, donate, participate, and be involved either individually or through your uh, company or organization. Uh, I would also ask you to stay tuned for other Meridian online events. There's a, been a robust set already and we're only halfway through the summer. Uh, a slate of upcoming virtual programs include a conversation next week, speaking of the UN, Stefan and Jerry and everyone, uh, U.S. Ambassador Kelly Kraft will be joining Meridian online for a conversation next week. I hope everyone stays healthy and safe wherever you are, and thank you again for joining us. We appreciate your uh, attendance and your support. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.